how far am I from where I want to be? I got to go through all this. I'm out. So for 10 years, I had what psychologists refer to as a fixed mindset. You are not a professionally trained musician, but you didn't let that stop you from becoming a musician. The mediocre method that you stick with is infinitely better than the perfect method that you abandon. But takes that first person to walk out and believe in changing the world using love or connection or unity and then more people follow. When you're really specific with the outcome that you want and you have a growth mindset, meaning you believe that talent and ability and skills are not innate, you're not born with them, but they can improve. We're not seeking perfection and we're personalizing it. So it fits for me and my unique journey. Kind of going back to that unity does not mean uniformity. If I had a month to live and the day before I left this earth, I got a chance to do a TED talk what is the most useful, actionable wisdom that I would want to share with people? Hello, amazing Heart Leader community. It is Amber here, and I am so inspired to share that I have our guest for this month, Steve Acho, and when I had the pleasure of talking to this individual, he not only inspired me to be a better person, but just having heard our conversation, Austin was also incredibly inspired. So to be able to have that within our own internal group and know that we get to bring this to our community, I cannot wait for you to hear everything that this gentleman has to say, and I have no doubt that you'll be inspired too. So Steve, thank you so much for being here, being willing to share your expertise, and for sharing some really big news with us, a great success for you as well. Do you mind sharing with our community what you found out just not that long ago? Sure. Yeah, days ago. Well, thank you so much for the very kind intro, and I'm very happy to be here and happy that I've already inspired people. That's great. Um, so I, uh, I just, I live in Detroit, and I just found out uh, that I will be giving a TED Talk next month. Um, I submitted all the, the content and a song that I wrote, and I'll be doing both of those, and I got chosen to do it. So I'm very excited about that because I've wanted to do one for a long time. Um, in fact, before I started doing keynote speeches, I was being, I was getting booked for music a lot. So a lot of the speakers bureaus would book, you know, some famous speaker, uh, some best-selling author or celebrity, you know, for a hundred thousand dollar, forty-five minute keynote speech, and then they would sell me as the guy that would write a custom song, usually a funny one about their organization or their event. And so I was doing all that. And what ended up happening is um, someone from the bureau called me and said, hey, we've got a client that wants to see if you're available in this city on this date, and they want you to include music. And I, and I thought, include music? What do they think I do? And they said, oh, they, they heard you on a bunch of, uh, you know, I, I wrote a couple books and I did kind of like a radio and podcast tour. And they ended up getting into all these other things that didn't have to do with music. My, I lived in Japan. I speak Japanese. I, they just dug into everything they found out about me. And I came across as like the success principle guy. So I sat back and I just thought like, I never thought of doing keynotes, but you know, I'm fine in front of an audience. I've been performing. I used to do stand up comedy. What, what is it? And this is literally the thought that, that led to what I do now. If, if I had a month to live, and the day before I left this earth, I got a chance to do a TED talk of whatever, an hour or however long it would be. What is the most useful, actionable wisdom, perspective, tactics, strategies, whatever about life that I would want to share with people? And I ended up writing a book on that that I never released. It just became my keynote speech. So the idea of like, what would my TED talk be has, in, has been in my mind for years, but I never really actively pursued it until I you know, got in touch with someone in the organization. So I'm very excited to do that. I'm incredibly excited as well. Now, the topic is something that's near and dear to our hearts mm. at Suivera because it's included in our mission. Mm. And there's a song 
that you wrote as well. Are you allowed to share what the topic is and this amazing song, like the lyrics we listened and it, it's, it's incredible. So <laughs> the song is, I want to make it our theme to be oh, quite honest. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. Um, so I, I wasn't thinking of doing a TED talk on this topic, but I earlier in the year just had an idea to write this song. I have a lot of, um, I guess, uh, how can I say it? O opinions about things that I, I don't, you know, I'm not a psychologist, but I, I read a lot on psychology. Um, I read a lot on spirituality. Um, and I just, I have kind of high level opinions about politics, not about any one politician versus another or any, ism or any right or left or anything like that, but just in general, how I believe the world would be a better place. And I've had this thought in my head for a long time that I wanted to articulate in a song, which is the name of the song is Unity. And the name of my talk is going to be something like uh, Build Bridges, Not Barriers, A Call for Unity. And <clears throat> the truth is that people do unite. I mean, we are humans are absolutely, you know, social creatures, no question from, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago uh, to now. What happens sometimes, and I think too often, is that people find unity or solidarity, and they band together in groups, which is a good thing in general. But the glue that binds them together is not fighting for a cause fighting for something it really the glue that binds them is a mutual hate or mutual disdain at the very least for other ideologies groups people ideas whatever it is and so that that unity is a good aspect but there can be a dark side to that and so i've, I've had these kind of i don't know lines in my head that turned into lyrics which which like the first line of the song is can you stand for a cause without bashing your brother. Um, be proud of who you are without being anti-other. I believe you can be proud of your heritage and not be anti any other race or anything else. You can celebrate it. So it's just kind of a call and hopefully, you know, music is, is art and it's a way that I hope evokes emotion and I hope it evokes a positive emotion. So I could stand here and tell you my ideas, maybe through story form or whatever, and that might be good. And I will talk a little bit about what I believe, but what I'm really going to say is, I hope I've captured this in a song and, you know, this is called unity. And then I'm going to start playing it, um, as you know, it hasn't been released yet. It'll be out, um, uh, the week before I do the Ted talk. So before the end of, of, uh, 2024, the song will be released globally. But, um, at the very end, I plan on singing the song and having a handful of people walk out on stage and they start singing the first chorus with me. And then more people come out and they start singing along and singing the second chorus. And then more till I have a dozen people just huddled around me at the piano and we're all singing unity and hopefully the audience is too, but it won't be a deal killer if it isn't. But I just have this, this idea in my head of there's just one guy talking about an idea, one guy who sits down and starts playing and singing and then it ends with unity, right? That with all these people joining me. And so that's kind of the vision that's in my head about this to, to hopefully drive the point home in an artistic way. Yeah. And I know it's not released yet. Fortunately, you were kind enough to send the lyrics and I got to read through them and they're beautiful. Thank you. The song too, by the way, if you want to hear it. I'm not sure if you heard it, but there's a audio. Yeah. I did. I didn't know if I was allowed since it's not released. I don't want to play it or anything, but I'm not Beyonce. Um, There's not big secrets with me. Uh, well, that's so good <laughs> because if we can, I would love to at least at a minimum post the lyrics. Oh, sure. That'd be great. Because it is very, the lyrics themselves are deeply profound oh, thank you. and something that hit deep in the core of me when I read them. That's and the song is beautiful as well. And then to hear that, it reminds me of a cartoon that I saw years ago that also resonated, which it had one person who stood against a group of very angry people mm -hmm. and everyone was yelling at this person and they were like, love. And every, the whole group was like, what? And then one follower jumped over 
And so now you have two people, the angry mobs yelling at them, and you have two people who are angry like, mob versus two now. Yeah. And then, so it takes that first person to walk out and believe in changing the world using love or connection or unity. And then more people follow and more people follow. And it's the same with unity. Unity doesn't mean uniformity. You're not giving away your identity sure. by connecting in some positive way. Right. You're just seeing the beauty in you and your own unique path while also honoring it in someone else. Mm. And so that vision to me is such a beautiful vision. It's You can all sing in your own unique voice. Mm. That's right. But have the same resonant message. Yeah. I love that that idea of the cartoon where it's the, the angry mob versus the one person who's doing something for, you know, there's a, there's the great mother Teresa quote where she says, don't ever invite me to an anti-war rally, but if you're having a peace rally, let me know where it is. It sounds like semantics, but um, I saw this uh, bumper sticker that said, I think socialism sucks, right? Just two words, socialism sucks. And it's like, you know, whatever your political affiliation is or beliefs are on isms that would be about the greatest good for the greatest number aside, a lot of people will join the group and saying anything from, yeah, today's weather sucks, doesn't it? To socialism sucks, to whatever it is. And now you've got these people banding together, but what are you for? Like, I get what you're against. So you're very loud about what you hate. But it's like that one person who's like, what about love? And everyone else is like, what? No, let's go back to this. This sucks. This is what we are passionate about. Well, you're passionate about what doesn't work, you know? And so to me, like her line is just so, it, it, it's just such a, a profound bit of wisdom that sounds like semantics and it's not at all, right? Like you can be proud of who you are and not be anti-other. You can be you can be for a change and everybody can band together and unite and have unity around the positive change. So that's where that came from. And I'm happy I'll get a chance to do it in front of some people and maybe even some more people when Ted releases it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it is a huge accomplishment. And I know you are very humble and your focus is on inspiring others and sparking that light in others because your light is already burning so brightly. But we also have to be willing to honor you because that's a huge, huge accomplishment. So thank you for sharing it with us and allowing us to kind of applaud thank you. your, of your achievement and the release of your song and all of the other amazing things that you've done while also being in service of others. Mm. Because to me, that's a strong message as well. Sure. So often we hear, how can I be in service of others? Because that'll take away from me. And I have to go after this in order to achieve greatness. And that means sacrificing being in service of others. Mm -hmm. But you're showing that that is not the case. I your think light not only can that, be but, really bright. But, right? but it means, but even science shows that selfishly, if you want to feel better right now, go do something for someone else. I mean, it is, it is measurable and cortisol levels and everything else we could talk about, but um, you know, so, so it really is true that it's not, it's not like a, a win lose situation to share with others. And I was thinking, you know, I, I read uh, some personal development book. I don't know what it was years ago. And the, the author was talking about how everyone has, whether they know it consciously or not, we have this kind of report card, this way that we grade ourselves on how we're doing at life. And so some people, for some people that might be, you know, how many, how like quantity of friends, or it might be um, amount of money or amount of toys, or it might be the, you know, number of buildings that have your name on it, or how many people know you. I'm not bashing any of that stuff. I'm just saying like, there's something that drives people. So they were saying like, what's your report card? And I, I really thought about it. And the truth is, this is not me like attempting to sound like a nice guy. This is just the absolute truth of what goes through my mind is the way that I met my yardstick for valuing how I'm doing is how useful can I be to how many? 
And so for me, the idea of, you know, you're walking out of a store and there's, you know, an elderly person behind you, like how much fuel are you burning in your brain to hold the door open for that person? Like, you don't even think about that, right? I extrapolate that into like someone I know has a kid who just lost his job. Okay. Like how useful can I be? Now I can't do that 24 hours a day or up because obviously like, you know, put, put on your own oxygen mask first. Right. So yeah, exactly. I'm just a great guy that donates all my money to, to every single cause that comes knocking on my door. Then I have no money and I can't take care of myself and therefore I can't be of service to others. So there has to be that, you know, that kind of balance. But I realized like that really is my report card. Like I hope that in every interaction from the smallest interaction um, to a relationship that doesn't work out even, right? That there's there's something useful. There's something positive that I contributed where it would be better than before. Like you are better off for having been in some kind of relation to me than you would have been otherwise. And that is what drives me. I think, you know, that my one definition of wisdom to me is having deathbed clarity long before you're on your deathbed. I mean, if you could deploy that every day, that would be, you would be the Buddha or Jesus or whatever. I, I don't, I don't know that that's possible, but to me, that's at least the goal and the definition, right? Is to, to just constantly be aware of what really matters and then, uh, have that manifest in real life. Right. So that, that kind of is what drives me. Um, but you're right. I do. You said I'm humble and I am, and it kind of, sometimes I get that imposter syndrome, like who am I to be saying this or who am I to be singing this song in front of this many people or whatever it is. But I, I heard something recently that I think you'll, you'll appreciate because I know you're humble too. Um, there's a, a psychologist that I, I really like who wrote a book. Now he's a, He's an author, but he's a uh, professor at a prestigious university uh, of psychology, uh, Adam Grant. And phenomenal. I mean, every, every little, you know, you see those little memes with quotes. I, I, most of them kind of, my eyes glaze over and I'm like, oh, it's more of kind of the same hundred year old wisdom of if you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Interesting, but, you know, like, that nice might little me. nugget to put in your memory. Yeah, it is. It's. It's. But then. But now, what are you going to do? Right? Are you going to be so motivated now? You're going to write that book you never wrote because you heard that Henry Ford quote. And I'm not knocking it, but everything Adam Grant writes is just like mic drop. It's perfectly said. In fact, this morning I just uh, I happened to see this this quote that he posted, and it had to do with unity. And I thought, man, he you know he really just encapsulated in three sentences what I'm trying to articulate like, this is really good. So anyways, the reason I bring him up is he's a very humble guy and he wrote his first book and he sent pre-release copies to his, you know, friends and other authors and uh, other professors. And one of the professors emailed him back and he said, love the book, hate the self-promotion. And as you know, and his heart just sank and minded me when I heard that, because I'm like, I know how I would feel if somebody said that about me, it just feels icky to me to to be to feel like I'm self-promoting right but yeah. he had this brilliant reframe of this idea I mean he is a very smart guy and has the ability to articulate fairly complex topics like like deep 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 psychology and just get to the so what of it so any fifth grader would understand it that's a high level skill to me right so he started thinking about it and he said, you know what? This isn't self-promotion. This is idea promotion. This isn't about me. This is bigger than me. And if you think about it as idea promotion, I want to spread the meme, for example, I personally, that we can find unity in service to others. And we can, we can collaborate with our 8 billion human neighbors for a cause as opposed to always collaborating against that was such a brilliant reframe to me to say, who am I not to share the, the things that I've been fortunate enough to learn and share my innate ability to be able to articulate this, these things that I'm not the first to say, but maybe I'm the best person to say for some thousands of people who have never heard it this way. So that, that kind of helps me with my, with my, like, I want, you know, I want to maintain humility 
problem because some things I do, like I said, I, I, how useful can I be, right? Like at the end of the time that people listen to this, I hope it's actually useful to other people. I will selfishly feel better about that, right? Not that, you know, a bunch of people are like, wow, that's an impressive guy. And then they go on with their lives, you know, isn't that an interesting take though? Idea, promotion, really two words, like change my perspective. Yes. We call it flip the script over here. Sure. I had come from an acting background and we yeah, always sure. had to like flip that script. Yeah, right. And exactly. I always have to pull myself back and look at it from other perspectives because yes, you can start to put yourself in a box yeah. if you let everyone else tell you what box to be in. Sure. So you have to be willing. Hey, Heart Leader community. This is Amber Mikesell and I am so excited. Silent Your Inner Critic has a release date. We'll be hitting shelves March of 2025 and you have an opportunity to get on the wait list by clicking the link below. And when you do, you're going to immediately get a gift from me. It is the Silence Your Inner Critic Starter Kit, where you'll get 13 tips to get started on silencing your inner critic before the book hits the shelves. Just before this call, you were talking about some of the ways that you help other people break out of their boxes and see things differently. And I took what you were mentioning about playing music. You are not a professionally trained musician but you didn't let that stop you from becoming a musician and writing a song that has hit my heart just from receiving it today. Yeah. Can you tell that story to the community? Yeah. Because sure. it, it reframed for me and flipped the script. So mm -hmm. I would love if you would share it. It's interesting. The music example is a good one. And it's one that when I give keynote speeches, I use because it's, it's my story of how I came to this, kind of framework that I apply to so many different areas of personal and professional life that they would seem completely unrelated. So I have this framework for essentially rapid learning, growth, like just no BS, strategy, tactics, this is what you do. And it applies to from everything from learning how to play music and be functional quickly learning a foreign language. Um, I speak Japanese. I, I um, have taught other people and I have a methodology that I specifically created for second language fluency for adults who think, who are, have that fixed mindset of, ah, once you're past five years old, your walls are built up or whatever they tell us about that. That's partially true, but it's, it's not an excuse. Like you can absolutely start learning a language today and be functional in it very, very quickly. So I have a methodology for that. I've been doing martial art my whole life, and I, I try and find ways to, to get better at that in sports. I've been injured a lot. I've found a way to be in the top 1%. I'm 52 years old, so I've had surgeries and injuries many times over. Um, I'm in the top 1%. Every surgeon and PT person has told me of the getting back to range of motion and strength for whatever I injured. I have had both hips replaced. I've had so many surgeries, right? So the I'll tell you the backstory of, of how I kind of backed into this, but it does have to do with music. Um, when I was young, I was about seven or eight years old. My cousin, uh, I think he, uh, he doesn't even play anymore, but, but he was playing by ear. He's playing the piano. Uh, some Beatles song and I was, I was singing it and I was just like, that, is, that was so cool to me that he was just jamming on the piano, you know? So I convinced my mom to send me to this super Saturday class. So every Saturday for 10 weeks, I would go to this piano class and I was geeked up about it. I was going to miss cartoons, right? On Saturday mornings to go to this. So the first class I go to, this is a very accomplished, well-respected classical piano player. Um, and I was the youngest one by pretty far, but there were other kids in the class. And so this is an hour class for a half hour. We talked about music theory and principles and chord progressions and major and minor scales and things that some of which I still don't understand after, after years. Um, and then we finally sat at the piano and we had to sit perfectly. We, you know, maybe we played a few notes and, uh, oh, all of it was over my head. I mean, I left, I probably literally left in tears. If not, I was just fighting them back because I was positive that seven, eight year old Steve 
was positive that I am not smart enough to understand this. Because first of all, I felt like everybody else did. And I just was not picking it up. It was like another language. Mm. And second of all, I just, whatever mini thing we did, I was terrible at. And I, it just made me think like, how far am I from where I want to be? I got to go through all this. I'm out. So for 10 years, I had what psychologists refer to as a fixed mindset, which is just, I was born like this. Some people are born to do music. Some people aren't. I, in third or fourth grade, I think I tried out for the, the Glee Club and I was, you know, one of the 10% of people that did not make it. But of course I didn't. I'm a bad singer. I'm bad at music. So I'm 17. And this is, this is where it all changed. My mom took my sister and I to a Billy Joel concert. That was my first concert. And he was standing up and playing the piano. And I already liked his music, but I had just never seen a live show like that. And it was so entertaining. And I just came back and was playing member records. So I had a record and I was just playing with a couple fingers. And I went to a friend of mine who's brilliant, still a very good friend of mine um, from many years ago. One of the smartest people I know happened to have a recording studio in his basement in 1980 something, which is like saying I have a spaceship right now. Um, and I said, can you just like, I told him about my seven year old experience and, you know, I'm like, I, I really want to do music. Like I'll do it, but I don't think I'm smart enough to get it. And he said, I think his exact words were, dude, you're making this way too complicated. Come here, here, let me give you this. And he, he brought out this, this sheet of paper that just had a handful of chords, which are just a combination of three notes. And it had like a picture of a piano. It's like a C chord is C E and G. You can just see it. Right. And he's like, I want you to memorize just a handful of these and then come back to me. So I did that. And then he gave me a book and he was like, don't worry about the notes, but I just want you to look at the chords. And so I started doing that. And I mean, in a few months, I was playing every Billy Joel and Elton John song ever written. I was playing and singing based on that. And I learned, he taught me without knowing the Pareto principle, the 80-20, right? Which, is, which basically says, you know, most of the results, good or bad, are going to come from just a handful of inputs. So what I didn't know is... You could be functional in music without having to understand all the complexity. And there's nothing wrong with it, by the way. Like to want to be a classical pianist, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. That's just not what I wanted. But nobody bothered to ask me. If that music teacher would have said, hey, what do you want? What are you here for, kid? I would have said, my cousin played a Beatles song and I want to be able to do that. Right. And so people might think it's irresponsible of him to say, let me show you how to play. Let it be. That's, a, that's an easy one. I'm just going to do this. And then we'll get to how to do it correctly later. How great would that have been, right? So that Very I, inspirational. It, Very I, inspirational. So, But I took 10 years to get to that. And then I started looking at everything almost from, and I don't mean this in a negative way, because I, I refer to myself as a professional hack sometimes. Because a hack is just getting to the thing that, it's the most efficient way of getting to the thing that you want to be able to do, right? So, I mean, if you want to lose weight or technically you want to transform your body, right? It's a hack to do push-ups because you're building muscle and muscle is the engine that burns fat. It's not thought of that way, but if you start building the biggest muscles in your body, that's where the that's where you'll, you know, lose the fat that you want to lose. So basically you can 80, 20 that. So I've taught a hundred people who are not interested in CrossFit or any of the crazy stuff that I do or sports. They're just like, I want to be healthy. I want to lose my beer belly. Okay. 80, 20 push, pull, squat, do it 20 times, repeat it five times, wait two days, do it again. Come back to me in a month. Changes everybody. So it's like the, the, the idea is it's not, CrossFit or it's my thyroid and I'm just always going to be like this. My family's like this. There's some middle. It's not, you know, uh, you're going to be at Carnegie Hall, you know, playing perfectly perfect piano or I'm just bad at music. If you want to be, you know, in, in middle school, high school, I wanted to be the guy that showed up at the party that had a piano. I wasn't, I was barely singing at the time. And Everyone else would be singing along, right? So I'm just playing a piano man, let's say, and everybody's singing along. Like, that's what I wanted to do. But nobody asked me, what do you want to do? What, what is your specific goal? So when you're really specific with the outcome that you want and you have a, a growth mindset, meaning you believe that 
talent and ability and skills are not innate. You're not born with them, but they can improve. Now you're born with, you know, everyone's born better and worse at certain cognitive abilities, but you absolutely, it's not even controversial in science that new neural pathways are built. So there's kind of a framework for how to do this that I can apply to, you know, again, hiring the right person the first time for your company. I have just a, a book on recruiting and it essentially follows the framework that I talk about, even if it's transforming your body or learning how to speak a new language. Or I just did a um, consulting or a coaching session with a guy who's been in the United States for 20 years um, from Peru, I think. I know he's uh, uh, Spanish speaking um, and he's in charge of, you know, 200 Americans that are, you know, native English speakers. And he is understandable. He has a thick accent. He understands most stuff, but his problem is he just doesn't have the confidence to communicate well. And in an hour session, I can give him the 80, 20 of what he needs to change. And that happened. I had two sessions with him and he's like, I am so much better in meetings with clients now. Like I'm more confident and everything else. And it's just, again, it's, there are techniques, there's kind of a framework to what to do, but all of that presupposes kind of the um, the prerequisite to all of that really is believing that you can get better at something with practice. And I think that the true silver bullet to everything is progress. I think that's, that's the one thing we need to focus on because the word motivation, like pe some people refer to me as a motivational speaker, which kind of makes me cringe. I know I, maybe I should feel good about it, but motivation to me is something that's external, right? Like I'm motivated because I want to make my family proud or my coach proud or whatever it is, right? I, I want to have the adoration of a bunch of fans, or but all of that is, is external. We want to be internally, intrinsically motivated. There is a extremely reliable way to remain motivated to keep going and not quit. And that way is the method that works for you to, to make sure that you're making regular progress, just progress. That's the one word. To feel like you are a better, whatever, guitar player, husband, wife, son, friend, uh, you know, business person, whatever, this month than you were last month, that is motivation because you feel like you're making progress, but how many people are going to stick with it if they take a, you know, Portuguese class and then they go to Brazil and they try and speak and they can't speak. And, you know, somebody asks them what time it is and they're already lost and they've been doing it for six months or a year. They, if they don't feel like they're making progress, they're just going to quit. Naturally, this didn't work. Right. So I always try to find the hack that will, because there isn't a, a perfect method for everyone, right? There's a, this is a Tim Ferriss quote, I believe, but he says the, the mediocre method that you stick with is infinitely better than the perfect method that you abandon. So there might be a perfect way for me to eat, but if I feel like, you know, I love food and I like flavor and I can't eat that way, even though it's perfect, eh, I give up, I'm done. So now I'm I'm at zero. Now I'm not going to improve anything. But if I but if I'm 70% of what I'm supposed to do and I stick with it, wow, I'm going to see progress, I'm going to feel it, I'm going to hear about it and that's what what essentially keeps us motivated. So that's what I try and do. There's a there's an 80/20 framework and there's all that. But it will help you believe in yourself whatever you're trying to learn how to do even if you think you're bad at it or learn how to improve even if you're already doing it, if you can find something where three or four days later you feel like you're making progress, it's you are going to continue to be motivated and you'll get better like this or maybe even like this because you'll want to spend more time on it. So I can give so many examples from different areas of life that seem unrelated but that are all you know, essentially outcomes of intrinsic motivation because we feel like we're making progress. Does that make sense? It does. And what I really appreciate about that approach is it's personalized mm -hmm. as well. So we're not seeking perfection. Sure. And we're personalizing it. 
So it fits for me and my unique journey. Kind of going back to that unity does not mean uniformity, mm, right? Right. We're seeking to be better together in many ways because when we feel better, when we're striving toward what fits best for us, it's still we can be internally motivated but do it together in a way that uplifts us together. Absolutely. And this 80-20 approach kind of helps support that. Mm. I, For me, one method may be perfect in that 80-20 approach. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that now I have to go and make you, Steve, a little mini version sure. of my perfect approach and yeah. say, well, it, it fits for me. It needs to fit for you because we're friends now. <laughs> and so to support me, you have to do it the same way I'm doing it. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good and point. What it, that's why I think it, it isn't it isn't a one thing. It's a, It's a one. I even hesitate to say this, but I think there are better and worse just frameworks for thinking about it. So even within the 80-20 principle, so just to give like the foreign language example, right? Um, there are 250,000 words in the English dictionary. So I've, I have a, a master's in business that I got while I was living and working in Japan. I communicate for a living. I've been writing a blog every week for eight years. Um, I, basically, I mean, I, I study communication, right? And I'm a native English speaker and I only use less than a thousand words. I might know more. I might understand more, but I only use a thousand words. So think about that in the context of someone that's, you know, moving to the U S or some English speaking country from China or somewhere else. And they have no, no background in English. And all they know is they got this dictionary and there's 250,000 words in it. That how daunting is that? But then they hear, if you literally know hundreds of words, the right ones for you in the context that you're going to be in, based on the people you're going to be talking to and the situations that you're going to be in and, and all of that, your persona, as long as they're relevant to that, what's the 80-20 of that? You your language ability will, I mean, if, even without me explaining how to do that, how to get the right content, how to practice it, how to train it, how to make sure even people with different learning styles can do this. Um, just, just that, how much less daunting is it? Now, to your point, the hundreds of words or dozens of phrases that you might need to learn in English to be functional, to do your job or to do whatever it is that you do, are going to be different for you and I, right? And they're going to be different for someone who's coming here as let's say a, a mother who is driving the kids to school and talking to the teacher versus a father, as an example, there's lots of uh, Japanese transplants in the Detroit area where I live. And that's kind of how it is. I mean, that's, they have their Japanese friends, the, the wives do, they might go play tennis with them. They talk to the teachers. Like I can predict what kind of conversations they're going to need to have. Some of them are here for five years and they just don't expose themselves to English because they're afraid, right, to do it. But I can give them that confidence by saying, you want to play tennis? Who calls to make a reservation? Oh, the only one person that speaks English. All right, now you do. How much do you think there is to, to know when you call a place and say, I would like a tennis court on Thursday. What times are available? I'm going to teach you all this stuff and you're going to do it once a week. And then guess what? You're going to be making progress because you're going to be doing that every week and you're going to get reinforcement of the things that are part of your life. Now, this woman's husband is not playing tennis. He's working at the office for 12 hours and he's in this manufacturing facility, let's say, right? He's got a kind of a different 80-20 that's going to build. So I'm not saying you hack and you just find the handful of things and you do the bare minimum. I'm saying you, you identify not the bare minimum, but the most important the, the few most critical things, elements, uh, words, phrases, whatever, versus the trivial many that you may never need to say. And that will give you motivation because you will absolutely see progress. So people always ask me, like, what's the best book or, or um, app, you know, if I want to learn Japanese? Is it this? Is it that? It's the one that works for you. It's the one that you'll keep doing. And it's the one that reinforces, I mean... If you're learning English and the first sentence you learn is how much for the pink ashtray, 
I don't, I don't know how often you're going to be called upon to say that word. It might be 10 years. It might be never. I don't think I've ever said that sentence out loud in my life. So you're not going to feel like you're Unless making you're a collector of pink ashtrays and you that want a whole house full. That one person <laughs> right. could be perfect <laughs> for them. One rare person. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> yeah. But just, you know, but just finding, and again, like I, you know, I can go back to applying this to, to people that tell me, I don't like sports. I, I don't want to exercise. I know I have to, it's affecting my health. I've got to, you know, some extra fat that I don't want. Okay. Like we're going to do an 80, 20 for you. Like here's the analysis. How much time are you willing to commit overall? That means if you join a gym, it's driving there and back and showering. Like how much time do you have? You give me that. I'm going to tell you what I think is the absolute best thing to do for you personally. You'll probably How want to do more. How empowering is that, right? It really it's is. so Just empowering when you start to way. feel progress. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's yeah. this empowering when you don't. I mean, I, I started learning Japanese when I was in high school. I was 16, 17. We were one of the first handful of high schools in Michigan to offer Japanese. So I took high school Japanese. And then I went to Japan when I was 17 with my karate instructor. and it was the most humbling thing ever. Uh, I, I just remember, I mean, nothing against school, but it, you know, sometimes the right way to learn something is a progression that turns everything into like a formula. Like the way they teach English in most places around the world is more like grammar and algebra than it is like spoken English. And it's not going to get you feeling like you're making progress unless all you're doing is taking tests. Then you're going to do great. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but it yeah, is it's so not conversational amazing. at all. Can you imagine uh, two years of Japanese? And I could honestly say, I remember standing next to someone in a store, these, uh, a mother and, and daughter that were talking. And I was, I sensed that they were Japanese, but I wasn't quite sure. Maybe it was Korean. I don't know. I didn't have enough knowledge at the time. But what was embarrassing for me is I had two years of Japanese behind me. And not only did I understand what they were saying, I didn't even know if they were speaking Japanese or Korean. Like that's kind of embarrassing. That does not motivate you to be like, I'm going to do another two years. Right. But then I got a tutor and I was like, here are the, th I have some Japanese friends. I go to karate class. I here are the ways that I use or could use or want to use Japanese. Help me with this. I'm going to practice these things. I'm going to, you know, obsess over the, the 20% that I'm going to hear 80% of the time and get good at it. And then, guess what? I was getting better. People were saying I was getting better and I felt like I was getting better. And then I wanted to do more. So that's the, the spiral I think that you want to ride. And it's not even a spiral to say that seven-year-old me could have gone forever and said, I'm just bad at music. But now the same kid that was bad at music and that was positive that I wasn't smart enough to understand it and certainly wasn't you know, capable of, of doing music. Now I have, I've been, I have something like 180 songs on, you know, Spotify and iTunes and YouTube and anywhere you can download or, or borrow or stream or steal music is where my music is. And I'm, I think I'm close to 60 million streams on Spotify. And that's just a guy who lives in Detroit who's putting out songs. I'm not on tour. I'm not part of a record label or anything like that. Right. So like, it's like, that's the same person. That but you here. are on stages. For sure. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely am. But that, so that not doesn't to really discount your progress. Sales. Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely am. But not, nothing really. I mean, I could talk in front of 10,000 people or even play a show. My, I'm not going to get a bunch of, you know, more music streams because anything more than like a cup of coffee, <laughs> you know, yeah. but you're right. I, I'm definitely in front of people, but I'm just comparing it to people that are on tour and that this is all they do for a living, right? They're in this city and they're spending the record labels, spending money advertising in this city and bringing people and here's my new song, and, you know, here, click here. And like, they're, you know, they're, they're really going at it and they're doing great. And again, like I, like I said before, it's not either I'm just bad at music, I'm not going to do it, or I'm never going to play for anybody else, or I need to be, you know, the next Taylor Swift or else it's kind of a waste. There's so much gray area in between where you can have really fulfillment if you're interested in being good at that thing. And that, exactly. I think, I, I use that word fulfillment on purpose because I think happy 
is too ambiguous and vague and overused word because happy is kind of like a state. Like I'm happy today because I just got good news. Oh, I'm sad today because I got bad news or I'm sad right now. But being fulfilled is almost part of your identity because you've built habits and practices and thoughts and beliefs and things that serve you and others. And therefore you feel fulfilled. So I, everything that I do is really towards fulfillment and part of that fulfillment as, which is, you know, part of your very, uh, the, the essence of, of your message and your mission, part of that fulfillment comes from inspiring others, not just me achieving success and standing on top of a mountain and going, I said I was going to do it and I did it. Like, Congratulations. Now what? <laughs> you know? Yeah. It is inspiring to someone like myself, though, that you showed a pathway, right? You didn't allow someone else to tell you this is what's possible because this is the method in which mm. this is done. Right. You were like, no, <clears throat> like, that is a method sure. for how this is done. But there are so many other methods. And so let me explore the method that will fit for me. And now you're going out and you're sharing with other people. There are so many methods. Mm. Let's find the one that will fit for you. And you even created a coaching. Yeah, or mix them. Let's grab from here. Like mixing music, right? Mm. That has become this big wave of mixing and even merging types of music. Mm. You have country and pop that come together. Yeah. So you've created an entire coaching approach around empowering people to do that. That is a good word. I don't use that word enough, but that is the correct word, empower. Because I'm not, I'm not giving them a method and, and they, they have to feel empowered to be like, I'm going to take this, be motivated to do it, feel progress and all that. But you're right. That's what it is. That's the hope right. anyway. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about that? I know you provided our community and we'll make certain it's available everywhere with a PDF that has a little bit about what you do, but there's, it's scratching the surface. Mm. And so can you dive in and share a little more about what you do to empower the people that you are in service of? Sure. So they can get an idea. So you, you just hinted at something that is, um, that is included in this framework because it's been such an important perspective for me that I, I don't even know exactly when it switched in my mind, but I tend to view everything as uh, an experiment. Almost everything that I do is, is an experiment. And so when people talk about failure or fear of failure or fear of rejection or reframing failure or whatever, I I almost don't understand it anymore because I don't look at anything really as a failure. It's everything is like a science test to me. So I have, I had this great idea that I was going to take, uh, I was making lots of money on cover songs. I was doing piano acoustic versions of popular songs. And I thought, okay, I have this great idea. It's an experiment. I'm, I'm an American who speaks Japanese. I'm going to cover a Japanese song that's sung by a woman and it's kind of a rock and, you know, mid tempo song. And I'm going to do a cool, I'm a male voice and I'm a, you know, gaijin, I'm a foreigner and I'm going to put it out there. And like, how great would that be? It was just an experiment. And I put out a video and it got 300,000 views and all this stuff. I probably made $10 off of it. Um, Now I did get an invite to go on, national tv in japan on a show called no dojima which is like our american idol and i represented the u.s so they have like this world idol and so that was fun they have like 30 million viewers so so something was accomplished there but my point is i had this idea that i had all these reasons why i thought it was smart and you know you could call it a failure like i thought i would get a lot of sales back at at that i could tell what itunes songs were selling literally how many downloads for which songs I'm going to be the only other version of that song. And there'll be a picture of me, a non-Japanese person. And right. Like it it cost me more money and time than it did than I made. Right. So, but I never, I think about stuff like that. I'm like, wow, I've really tried a lot of things, but I never think of it as like, ah, I failed. I failed. So it really is truly 
mapping everything you do or or having this mentality like I'm going to experiment. I'm going to experiment and try this and just see what happens and I'm going to learn from it. Um, and so what you said and what and the other thing is that when you said experiment with different methods, there isn't just one right way. I have there's this quote that I um, I might have invented. I don't even know. I have to, I, I need to look this up before I put it up on a PowerPoint or anything. Um, <clears throat> but I think that the <clears throat> I'm trying to think of exactly how I said it. There is there is one right way. There is one correct, perfect method to get your nutrition, to build muscle, to lose fat to learn how to be better at business, to learn a new language, to learn how to play a musical instrument. I'll go on and on. And that method is the one that works for you. That's what it is. That's that's the, the goal of like whole, the whole experiment thing, right? And so this is like kind of one of the concepts is if you can have that in your mind, and even my favorite business guru, his name's Jay Abraham, has this amazing quote that is, there are no great marketers, only great testers. So he has all this, you know, decades of experience just multiplying the, the sales of a business by experimenting with, you know, five different things. Like, for example, uh, five different ways to greet someone when they walk in your furniture store. There was one way out of, out of the five that they tested across hundreds of stores in the country that was producing five times more sales. I mean, it could have been any one of the five. So he wasn't so arrogant as to say, I know what you should do. He was like, let's test. Let's test another one, right? So everything's an experiment. So I think that's that's an important perspective, right? That's kind of what you were getting at. Yes, yes, yes. Um, we are huge fans of testing. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, just to kind of to get back into the, the very actionable concepts. Um, so the PDF that I, that I shared with your group won't have any of this stuff in it because I think it's, it's mostly about mindset mastery and it's about uh, your self-talk and really monitoring your self-talk and how, you know, we ask, we say, we have this inner roommate in our head, right. Who follows us around all day. And, you know, we're talking right now and, I have a voice in my head and you have a voice in your head saying, I thought this guy was supposed to be handsome and he's not, and he's full of it or whatever your voice is saying it's in there and you can't get rid of it, but you can be conscious of what it's saying. And you can understand that we often say things and especially ask questions internally or out loud that are really harmful for us. And so one example is something like, why does this always happen to me? Right. I mean, that's, of course, this would happen to me. Why does this always happen to me? And you're saying it's like, it's not, it's not a real question, but your subconscious doesn't know that. And so subconsciously, your brain is going to work on the answer. Why do I always date people that are toxic? Right. Like I might say that out loud, let's say as an example. Right. So then my brain is going to work on the answer. The answer, I guarantee, is not going to be because I'm a lovable, smart, you know, well-intentioned person. It's going to be something like because I'm not lovable, because I'm not worthy of blah, blah, blah. It was just a bad question, and your mind goes to work on the answers. So uh, what's in the PDF is kind of some some different ways to, to monitor your self-talk and to ask better questions. And so one example of a better question is... Uh, when you're assessing a problem or in the middle of something um, is just to say, what would be ideal? What would it feel like if this were ideal? Sometimes I catch myself in my IT business. We, um, we do some work with the federal government and it's, it's a very complex, time consuming, frustrating industry. And I catch myself saying, why does this have to be so whatever, some negative word, right? Why does this have to be so frustrating? But then I'll stop myself and I'll, I'll just switch it to, but what would it feel like if it weren't? What would it feel like if it were ideal? What would it feel like if there were smooth communications? And even if I don't know the answer, my mind is going to work on the answer. And that's at least better. And that comes from a concept. A lot of people aren't familiar with this word. Have you heard the word pre-suasion? Not persuasion, but pre-suasion. Okay, you know that word. I have. So, um, 
So that what that is, is essentially saying something or asking a question that puts the listener in a place where they're more likely to have a positive response. Now, they use this in radio advertising all the time. Every time you hear, what would you do with $10,000, right? There is no bad answer to that. I don't care how much money you have. If your subconscious is thinking, what would I do with if I just found $10,000 in my pocket, right? And now you're more open to hearing what they have to say next, even though you're not consciously thinking about it. So when you use things like this, you can really very quickly, I mean, this is a, a tactic. This is an actionable thing that you can do right now is just monitor that voice, ask better questions. And then you can even use this. To, I'll give you one kind of piece of career advice that I um, have shared with a lot of people that are interviewing for jobs that uses this persuasion principle is <clears throat> um, if you were interviewing me and I said, uh, hi, Amber, I'm Steve Acho. It's so nice to meet you. Thank you for uh, interviewing me, considering me for this job today. I'll, I'll let you run the meeting, but I just have one question, if you don't mind. What is it that you heard about me or that you saw on my resume that made you even interested in meeting with me in the first place? And so what that does is two things. One, it kind of drops this, it's this positive bomb that I just dropped because now you have to search for anything positive, even if you don't like me, right? It doesn't matter what your impression or whatever. Now I've asked you a question that forces you to think of something good. And so they might say, oh, my friend Mike knows you and says very good things about you. It might be just that. But more practically, it might, they might, and this has happened to me before in like sales and in other places where I've asked a similar question. I find out something that's important to them that I never would have known was important. And we end up steering the conversation that way because I wouldn't have known that that was an important topic to them. So that's, these are kind of tactics that you use with yourself and with other people in order to, to get kind of a better response. So that, that kind of the, the mental framework and the, the reframing of, of questions and statements that you say either silently or to other people, I think are, um, are super important and they're kind of a prerequisite or else you're just not going to get to a point. You're going to, you're going to do one piano lesson or French lesson or whatever. And you're going to say, ah, I'm not good at this. But if you have that, that, kind of not positive mindset. I, I don't, I don't even like to say that because there is something that's called toxic positivity. Um, and I, I think it can kind of be a negative thing. Um, especially if you're like comforting a friend who's down and you say, Oh, look at the bright side. Like you're kind of taking away their, the natural inclination to, to grieve over something that maybe they should be grieving about. Right. So like not everything positive is good, but if you can reframe something to at least ask better questions uh, or, or even have better statements to yourself, then you can then you say, all right, now I'm going to start. I'm going to learn how to do this well and I'm going to start today. And like, you know, here's the framework. Right. And I've even it's funny because when it comes to questions, I've even changed how I ask questions. Because I'm, I'm fortunate enough to have uh, a good handful of very, very, very smart, accomplished, successful people that also happen to be amazing human beings. They're not just, you know, wealthy or whatever. They're, they're just incredible people. And so I end up asking for advice a lot. And I've, I've learned through experimenting that, you know, everyone has, we're all living the movie of our own lives, right? So you, you might be 10 times smarter than me in general or on one specific topic, and I might come to you for advice. I don't say things like, what would you do if you were me? Or, you know, what do you think I should do? Or Because you're going to come at it from whatever confluences of your, you know, your life up until now and your beliefs and assumptions and influences are. What I do instead is I say, this is what I'm struggling with how would you encourage me to think about this? Because more of the wisdom that I get from people is not so much the answer. Like, should I move to another country or not? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. My smart friend said, yes, I'm going to move. It's like, how do you think about that? That's, that's where the gold is. And so even getting better at asking questions to yourself and to other people will, uh, you know, kind of raise the value of, of anything that you're looking to understand better. Right. Yeah. I love that. It's like, again, shifting that perspective, right. 
understanding that we're all coming at life through our own lens. Sure. And they can't shift their lens. Even with good intention. I can't shift my lens. Yeah. Right. So what is my lens observing about the movie of your life? Mm -hmm. And how can I offer a different perspective based on that lens? That's a great way to say it. Yeah. That's what the right. question gets at, right? Because now I'm I'm asking you to think about like for me, how would you encourage me to just like what should I think through in getting to the answer? You don't even have to tell me the, what you think the answer should be. And that I, just something, you know, simple things like that in, in business and personal life, I think have, have made a big change. So, you know, sometimes you can inspire people without knowing that you are. I actually wrote, I started writing a blog years ago. I write once a week. I don't monetize it. I don't know how many people read it, but I do get some fulfillment out of it because a lot of people write me back and they're like, I needed to hear this today. This changed my life. What's your address? I want to print one of the blog posts that you did because it changed me and I want to send it to you on it. Like, I mean, all this stuff has happened and it's great. But one thing that I wrote years ago, somebody told me a few years later that they were on the verge of suicide and they heard the story that I told, very short story. And my blogs are 30 seconds long if you read them. Um, and he's been thinking differently ever since. He shared that with me. I never would have known. I never would have directed it at someone that was contemplating suicide. So you just never know, right? What yeah. what perspective you're giving someone that could that could influence their life in a positive way. That's a beautiful story. Now, if someone wants to get to your blog or would like to learn more about you, Maybe they do have a need for a keynote or they're looking for a coach who sees things through a unique lens and isn't asking them to conform to a very specific program. How do they get a hold of you? Sure. Yeah. Um, my website is just my name, Steve Acho, Steve, A-C-H-O dot com. Um, and I'm happy to connect with people on LinkedIn or any of the socials. But uh, yeah, fortunately, there's no one else with my name. So uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I can't commit a crime or else once you search my name, that's going to be the first thing that pops up. So, you know, I'm unlucky there. Well, given your perspective on life, I don't think that'll be an issue. <laughs> I won't intentionally commit a crime. <laughs> you are caught dead to rights, inspiring people and helping them live their best life, right? So how dare you? <laughs> right. How dare I? <laughs> Right. We will make sure that all those links are available as well as the tool. And thankfully, you're allowing us to put your lyrics to your song out there. And it will be released, you said, by the end of the year so they could go out and download it on Spotify or yeah. any of the other, wherever they stream music. Wherever you listen to music. To get there's, the more, there's more music platforms that pay me than I've even heard of, fortunately. So. Well, that's a, a good problem to have, room. right? <laughs> <laughs> In the realm of all the things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the TEDx, that will be happening on uh, that, what date? That is uh, September 18th, 2024 in Detroit. All right. So not long. And do you know if it'll be something that they'll be able, our audience will be able to go and download or is oh, yeah. that still? The, the okay. overall TED organization, whenever they're ready, which apparently is six weeks or so, but I don't know for sure. But yeah, they, they post all those on their, uh, on the TED organization site. So I'll be so then sharing that. It'll be on your site, right? For sure. So yeah. if people go to Steve Acho, they'll be able to click and watch you on TEDx yeah, as well. And I do have uh, an email list where I share um, the, the weekly blog just once a week. It's a 20 second read and um, uh, little updates about music and, and podcasts and things like that. So love for people to subscribe there if they feel like that's valuable. That's awesome. Now, often we like to wrap up by asking our guests, you know, for us, we created the Heart Leader podcast so individuals can take inspiration from those that we recognize as heart leaders, those who have aligned that heart-centered nature 
with logic and desire to lead a life from that heart-centered space. When you hear yourself called a heart leader, what does that invoke within you? What do you feel? What does being a heart leader mean? The first thing I think of is that we we aren't what we say. We are what we do. And so for me, some of the things that I, the, the habits that I've uh, incorporated into my just daily life are, I have, uh, I did a New Year's resolution years ago that I kept. I've kept, I don't know how many years it's been, but I, I decided I was not going to hold in an honest compliment. So people, my friends and people that know me, they, it's almost annoying to them, or at least it's so in character, like they know I'm going to do it. But, you know, 50 times a day, I'm, I'm just automatically thinking like, what do I admire about this person? So it's the, the young lady at the checkout line, right? Um, who's, who's scanning groceries. Like, I really like your nails or I, I like your hair. Like what color is that? I know it's not red. It's got to have some cool name, but it's, or I like your tattoo or whatever it is. I, I'm naturally, I'm not looking for anything back. Right. Um, and so I'm, I'm trying to act in a way that makes the walk, the talk more normal. And especially for example, if it's like a female that I'm complimenting, I, I want to be able to normalize that a man can give a woman a compliment. That's not, you know, th- that's obviously just an honest compliment and then walk away, not for any reason, not to get anything out of it or pick her up or anything like that. I want that to be a more normal thing. So I try and act from the heart in a way where I think is, is a positive way to be, but where other people I hope notice that like that guy just walked back to help this pregnant lady put, you know, groceries in her car. Like I have faith in humanity, (laughs) you know, like I'm going to act from my heart, not just say a bunch of things that make me sound like a nice guy. So I'm virtue signaling to whoever's listening. Right. So that's, that's kind of what I think of as walking the talk is I have it in my heart, but it kind of doesn't matter unless you can see the results of that manifest in the real world. That's a beautiful description. Thank you you for sharing. And thank you for being on the podcast and sharing your soul with the community. We look forward to continuing to get to know you. And I'll definitely be tuning in to your TED Talk. Oh, great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I love what you're doing. Please keep it up. Thank you. You too. Until we talk again. 